Inuit people in Canada live across the far north, the near north, and points south. In September, they elected a new voice to represent them, regardless of where they live. Natan Obed is president of the Inuit Taparit Kanatami, and he joins us now for more. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, congratulations on the new gig. Thank you very much. How are you enjoying much. it so far? It's been really exciting, and I'm really enjoying it. Good. Let's start at the beginning. The name of your organization, Inuit Taparit Kanatami, means yes. what? It means that Inuit are united in Canada. And is that true? Absolutely. We call our Inuit homeland Inuit Nunangat, which is the compilation of all of our different settlement regions. Um, Nunatsiavut is in the east, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Nunavik is in northern Quebec. Nunavut, of course, is the, the uh, jurisdiction that most people know. Mm -hmm. And then the Inuvialuit live in the Northwest Territories. So those are our four regions. Now, you run this organization, but you were not hired as the president, right? You were elected? Yes. How did that go? Well, uh, each of the presidents of the four land claim organizations and their delegates um, elect a president every three years at our AGM. And that happened in September. And it was, I was running against two other people, the incumbent and another uh, person who was, was put his name forward. It was Hillary and Bernie, wasn't it? No, no, sorry, I'm all confused. <laughs> ah, wrong race, okay. <laughs> sorry, keep going. No. Uh, and it, it sparked a lot of discussions about, about who should repre represent Inuit. But in the end, I won. And I feel very confident that I can be the, the voice in the, of, of Inuit and you know, can lead us nationally. And you actually defeated the person who had the job previous to that? Yes. You buried the lead there, Natan. <laughs> okay, that's been, Were you surprised that you won? I knew that I had presented as best I could, and I was confident that I was uh, giving a, um, you know, a perspective and, a, and a, a particular way in which I lead to them that they would have to consider. So I wasn't necessarily surprised, but I, I was kind of frozen in the moment, if you will. I, I, all of it hit me all at once, and I was, at one, I was overjoyed, but I was also just struck by the gravity of the moment as well. So if you look at pictures of me in that moment, I do look a little bit dazed. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people do you represent? 60,000. 60,000, okay. Do, um, do the campaigns get as nasty as they do, say, for Prime Minister of Canada or President of the United States? There, there are people that want to slag anyone. Right? And, but as far as the candidates, um, the people that I ran against, uh, we talked, we were, it was amicable. I, there was a, an understanding that we were all running for a position, but we weren't necessarily running against each other. Well, for example, how's your Anuktutuk? My Anuktutuk isn't great. I'm not fluent, and I'm And people brought that up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Was that fair game to bring that up? I think it is. I think that people should be weighing all of the different qualities uh, or detriments of any leader that they choose. And so that is obviously something that I need to improve but it also represents a large portion of my generation and the younger Inuit who are struggling to keep our language and um, haven't had the opportunity for one reason or another. Now, I know you told me in the, in the first answer that you thought, as the name of your organization suggests, that the Inuit of Canada are all united. Having said that, you ran on a kind of a unity platform on yes. the desire to uh, make sure that your community is united. So I presume you don't run on that unless you think there's a problem in that area. Fair to say? Correct. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, over the last 40 to 50 years, the government of Canada has uh, entered into land claim agreements with each one of our regions. Before those land claim agreements, uh, there was no such thing as a beneficiary of a certain claim. And this is the way you know, First Nations also with, the, with treaties or with modern treaties uh, have also had to deal with identity and also togetherness. Inuit ha share a same culture, the same language, um, the same way of, of looking at the world across all of Canada and, and circumpolarly. But um, our political structures and our uh, association with colonialism and with the churches and residential schools and the Hudson's Bay Company and the government of Canada is all different. Uh, so in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, we've kind of spread into our own spaces and somehow have 
um, not appreciated um, the unity that, that we should have and, and the similarities that we have uh, amongst each other and have focused more on our own regions or sometimes on our own perspective. So I'm going to try to, to bring that unity back in a way that will overcome some of the huge challenges that we have that we face together. How do you do that? Well, first it's talking about uh, the challenges that we have in a way that, if, that can touch each and every one of us. Make a list. What are the top three challenges in your view? Well, people have said education, language, and suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. Those are the three things that people talk again and again about of what people want uh, for their children or what people want to uh, overcome when it comes to their lives. Do you think it's possible to make progress on those issues? Absolutely. Hasn't been a lot of progress in recent years, right? No. Uh, we, we do have pockets of success. We do have great things that are happening in our communities and across our regions but we don't have sustained, measured success um, as a group of people on those three areas. What will it take to get that? Well, you know, uh, government support is also one of the foundational building blocks of that. You know, we're Canadians. We live in uh, jurisdictions. Uh, our school systems are public school systems. You know, we, we want the, what all Canadians want for their children, and we're a part of the public structure and so we hope that we'll be treated uh, fairly in, in the way that funds are allocated. But also uh, schools are, are um, across Canada are run by parents, they're run by school boards, they're run by communities and I think sometimes we don't get that right to run our school systems in, in the way that's best for our children, whether it's schooling in our language, having culture in the curriculum in the classrooms or whether it's a focus on what we want out of the, the education as a whole. Would you like Inuktitut to be one of the official languages of Canada? That would be a wonderful day. Uh, I will start by thinking of it in a policy perspective and saying um, the Inuit language, Inuktitut, uh, should be funded the same way that French is or the same way that English is when it comes to the importance of it uh, in our regions. And then there is a wider discussion about Canada and you know the the amazing um, diversity of languages that we have in Canada, much of which are held by its indigenous people, and mu and many of which are in danger of being lost forever. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a rich cultural diversity in Canada that I don't think we can afford to lose. And from our communities, it is an indelible part of us. And we should be working with governments and, and with the federal government to ensure that that's never lost. It, you know, you're going to forgive this smart like question here, but if it's an indelible part of you, how come you don't speak it very well? Well, um, my father uh, was relocated from his original homeland when he was seven. Uh, he was put in an orphanage when he was nine. And his homeland was where? In uh, Newtok in, nor in northern Labrador. Okay. <clears throat> so. He, he was in an orphanage from the time he was nine to his 18. Um, he, when he got out of that orphanage, he was in St. Anthony, Newfoundland. Uh, he didn't speak his language very well. Mm -hmm. He didn't speak Inuk to do very well. So you're playing catch up here. And so then when he married my mother and they had a, we, I have two siblings, uh, three kids, um, it still was something that really hurt in, in, inside of him. And he didn't ever speak the language to us. And so we grew up um, knowing that it was a part of us, but not having the ability to, to actually learn it and to, to use it in our lives. So I grew up knowing what I had lost. And so uh, when my wife and I had children, I have two boys, eight and six, Panagusik and Jushu are their names, we made sure that they would get Inuktitut. And so I've been able to ensure that both of my boys are fluent speakers of Inuktitut. They learned it in school? Uh, they learned it in daycare. In daycare. And then it's now in, uh, they're learning it in school as well. Great. Where's home for you? My home originally is Nain Nunatsiavut, which is in northern Labrador. But my wife is from Iqaluit Nunavut. And we met um, 10 years ago in Ottawa. And when we got married, I moved to Iqaluit and I've lived there for the last 10 years. In Iqaluit. Yes. Uh, again, you're going to forgive me for doing this. Because some people watching this right now are going to say, what? He's got, he's got an eight-year-old kid? 
because you look about 24. You'll forgive Thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but you're 39, eh? Yes, I am. You're 39 years old. Okay, which explains why your children are at the ages that they're at. <laughs> Here's a bit of an odd question, uh, Natan, so hang in there with me. Do you consider yourself a Canadian? Yes, absolutely. You know there are some Aboriginal Canadians who don't consider themselves Canadians, right? Yes. But you do. Yes. Canadian Inuit are very patriotic. Uh, we are proud Canadians. We also are proud Inuit. And so we can be both. And the settlement of our land claim agreements and the certainty that we have in the relationship with Canada, in principle, has allowed us to feel like we are a part of Canada. Now, what we uh, do moving forward and how Canada treats us uh, will ensure that we have a positive uh, relationship moving forward. I want to ask you about something that uh, has been in the headlines a lot over the past several years, mostly, I think, in the United States mm -hmm. because of the name of the football team that plays in Washington. Right. They have been the Washington Redskins since the 1930s. They were actually the Boston Redskins before that. Mm -hmm. You made headlines during the last Great Cup here in Canada last year when you talked about the Edmonton, well, you, wouldn't, you don't say the name, right? You don't say the Edmonton Eskimos, which, who have been the Eskimos since 1949. You've called that name outdated, derogatory, and enduring relic of colonial power. Yes. Uh, what kind of reaction did you get when you suggested that was your feeling towards the Edmonton CFL football team? Well, uh, it, was, it was as expected in many ways. There were some people that were sympathetic. Um, many Canadians just don't care. And then there were also a very loud minority of people who used that opportunity to uh, uh, to, to be, to be uh, rather rude to myself and to Inuit in general. So uh, that's the way that most of um, the Indigenous mascots issues as sports teams uh, debates have gone. I think that we can move beyond that debate and I hope that by bringing it up on the, uh, um, in regard to how it affects us as Inuit, uh, that it'll move this debate forward. Well, last uh, November during Grey Cup week, Bob Weber, writing in the Canadian press, said the following, the only Inuk ever to play for the Eskimos, he suited up as a halfback in 1955, said he doesn't have a problem with the name. I think we should take pride in that, said Kivyak, a lawyer known as David Ward, before he fought a legal battle to use his original Inuit name. I don't understand their argument, he said. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction? Well, I think that uh, Justin Trudeau is our Prime Minister, and I could probably go on any street corner in Toronto and find any number of people who would say that they don't believe that he is leading the country in the right direction. That does not diminish the power for him to lead or to make policy, and it is a democratic institution behind him that makes that possible. So I would say for Canadians and for even Inuit who have concerns with the name, that there are democratic institutions that have um, put me in the position that I'm in, and this is a part of reconciliation. Have you met with the Edmonton football team ownership over this issue? Yes. You have? How'd that go? It went quite well, actually. Um, you know, there's a lack of knowledge um, about Inuit across Canada, and uh, the Edmonton football team is no exception. I, I, you know, this, is, this is a case um, where there was, we can talk without uh, insulting each other. Mm -hmm. We can talk without blaming one another for uh, the circumstances that led to this particular name. But it's did they incidental. tell you? Did they tell you they would entertain the idea of changing the team name? They stopped short of that, but they heard what I had to say. And basically, there are three points to this. The first, we've called ourselves Inuit uh, since we mobilized in the early 1970s. The term um, Eskimos is outdated. And even if some of our people are not offended by it, others are gravely offended by it because they grew up being called um, the, that as a derogatory name that was meant to, to hurt them mm -hmm. and to put them down. The second, uh, Inuit are not mascots. We're not monikers. Uh, no indigenous people uh, are mascots, uh, especially if it's for sports entertainment. And for the, first, uh, for the third, in this era of reconciliation, uh, in this area where, era where we are trying to forge a new path between Indigenous Canadians and all of Canadians. This is one of those areas where we just have to say uh, times have changed. We don't 
we don't see you the way we used to see you. Uh, we, uh, you know, as the Prime Minister said in his address last week, Indigenous lives matter. And that means actually thinking about people uh, beyond, beyond just the way that you look at people from the past. Okay, let's, um, let's move on to talk about new leaders and a new era. We have a uh, relatively young Prime Minister of Canada right now. Uh, in the Indigenous world, there are also, like yourself, other younger leaders. Yes. Do you, what's your view about the responsibility this new generation feels to sort of come in, take the, uh, the levers of power, and get it right? Mm -hmm. Well, from the Inuit perspective, the generation that came before me uh, did amazing, amazing work. Uh, you know, our, we are now entrenched in the Constitution. We have four uh, settlement areas with comprehensive land claims agreements that the last generation had settled. Uh, they changed the landscape of Canada. They, you know, they changed the map of Canada uh, in the creation of Nunavut in 1999. So they did amazing work for their communities, for their people, for our people. I, I studied these agreements in university. I um, have been mentored by many uh, of the, the Inuit that have, have done this great work, such as Mary Simon. But I'm coming into this job with uh, a nuanced perspective. I'm coming into the perspective of using all the assets that we have now that we didn't have in the past and trying to get the most out of them. And now it's time for change to actually happen. We have set the foundation for change through all of the work that has been done in the last 40 years, uh, whether it be Inuit or the larger indigenous movement. And now it's time for us to figure out how to actually get what we wanted out of the whole process in the first place. Well, to that end, you've met with Prime Minister Trudeau, yes? Yes. How'd that go? It went quite well. And we talked about the issues that were specific to us and our needs. And then we talked about a, a way forward. So I think we're on the second step. Uh, the next step will be um, actually doing the work and, and showing results. You know, politicians have, um, they do a lot of courtesy call meetings, you know, show up, get your picture taken, shake some hands, and nothing much happens after that. Right. Are you more hopeful that something substantive will come out of your meeting with the PM? Yes, I am. And it's because we worked the whole meeting. We had an hour with him. And so as we said at the outset that we're going to use every second. And we went through all the issues that we collectively across Inuit Nunangat wanted to raise with the Prime Minister. He listened intently and, and um, pledged to work with us to work on our issues. Um, but within the lens of what the federal government can do. So we have our positions, the things that we want. The federal government has stated many things that they want, it, want to do for Indigenous people. There is a large middle ground uh, that, that we can work in to show results and to actually make change. So if, if you got to the end of that meeting and you said, Prime Minister, here's the first thing you can do to demonstrate your goodwill towards our organization and our people, what's that thing? Well, I, I will say that there are two things. Okay. The first is the governance, getting the relationship right and making sure that at a political level and at a working level that we are having a fair relationship. Uh, the other thing that is in the upcoming budget, uh, we need to see uh, that behind the rhetoric and behind the goodwill, there is money. And that especially for infrastructure in our communities, we've got a housing crisis. We have most of our communities which are uh, marine communities that don't have ports. We have crumbling infrastructure, if we have any infrastructure at all, for things like um, water treatment or waste, dis waste disposal. So I, I hope that uh, this will translate into money and a change in relationship. Where'd you go to university? I went to Tufts University. You went where? To Tufts University. Tu in Boston? Yes. Wouldn't you love to uh, have a university in northern Canada? Yes, that would be an amazing um, development. Is that somewhere on the list? It is. We've been talking about an Arctic University for years now. Mm. And I think that we should dream big for what is possible. I don't think that we have to settle for um, southern institutions that have particular um, relationships and quasi-campuses. You know, uh, I think we can actually have a, a facility 
and have a, you know, an innovative uh, program that respects our history, but also gets us prepared for meeting the challenges of the 20, 21st century. Gotcha. Natan, it's good to meet you, and good luck with your work. Thanks. It's great to meet you, too. Natan Obed, president of the Inuit Taparit Kanatami. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.